this will be available for any reminders you want. I'm gonna go over things related to the essay. At any point during the discussion, you can uh, post a question in the chat. In fact, right now, if you have any questions that have come up as you're writing, post those in the chat and don't hesitate to interrupt me. Alyssa, can you monitor the chat and um, let them, um, you know, like interrupt me as needed? And I'm happy to do that. By the way, Alyssa, what's your availability like right now? Um, recently, I haven't been meeting with as many students. I think probably while everyone's um, drafting their essays. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty available. So just message me at my email or through Canvas and I'll be happy to meet with you guys. A couple of things I want to mention is we don't have a synchronous class session on Wednesday or next Monday. And the reason why I did that is right now you're writing. We could meet together and I can say the same things over and over and over again. But I think it's a better use of our time to give you extra time to write, extra time to get feedback from Alyssa, from me, or from a writing center tutor. I have opened up the, the times on Monday and Wednesday, or on Wednesday and on Monday on the schedule. So you can make an appointment to see me then. If all the times fill up, then I may add some additional office hours, but I'm not gonna do that as long as I have spots that are open. We're going to return to synchronous sessions on Monday, November 30. And at that point, we're going to start putting all our stories into the book and thinking about how we can share this book with people outside of our class. Also, I suspect that some of you are writing things that you would like to include in this book because this book is about America and what is America. And anything you write about is going to have the concept of American values, affirming traditional values, subverting traditional values, or promoting other kinds of values that you think should be American values. Because that's what we do when we talk about what America should be or what it is. And so if you decide that you wanna have this included into our book, that will be fine, but that's what we're gonna be doing the last part of class as you're finishing up. Questions about that schedule? So what's due next? Your peer review for the introduction is due Wednesday, November 18. So on Thursday, I'm gonna go through and award those points. Keep in mind, you should be writing directly on the student's paper and you should give some overview comments. The peer review for your full draft, I've said Wednesday, November 25th, that was the original date because I was hoping everything would be done for Thanksgiving and you wouldn't have to do things on Thanksgiving. But if your group has consensus and agrees, then it can be due um, Saturday, November 28th. Or yeah, Saturday, November 28th. But that's everybody in the group has to agree. Uh, yeah. Questions about those deadlines? As I read through, you know, I gave you some instruction on the essay in a slide deck instead of doing this in class. And as I read through your comments, I made comments to you about what you wrote, but I also wrote down some common questions that students asked. And I wanna address those now so we can dialogue about them. And so if you have questions about what I'm saying, go ahead and ask um, in the chat or just interrupting me, you know I'm okay with that. 
One question that I saw over and over again was about audience. You have two audiences. One is students at SDSU, not just, um, not just any student, but you're assuming your student, based on your article or your argument, you are assuming certain beliefs, understandings of your audience that they share some values with you. I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute, but first I wanna address the secondary audience of professors. A few of you asked, I don't know what professors want and I do wanna tell you what we want. First of all, none of us expect first year or second year students or even any undergraduate students to sound like Teresa Tony. I don't want you to sound like Teresa Tony. If you sound like Teresa Tony, you're not gonna connect with your primary audience of students. So given that I don't expect that, what do I expect? What would other professors expect? Logic. You should have clear and logical analysis that leads readers to your conclusion, which is your thesis. I also expect honest and ethical use of evidence. What do I mean by that? Don't misrepresent what an author is saying. Don't force an author's words or the evidence or the statistics or the data to say something that it doesn't say. Um, I also expect clarity of language. Frequently students say, oh, I think my paper's not good because I don't have elevated vocabulary. Elevated vocabulary can be useful, but what's more useful than four syllable words is words that actually work together to say something, to evoke an idea, to evoke emotions, to allow readers to actually see something. And so if your essay is not filled with four syllable words, that might be the best thing. Um, sometimes when we try to use elevated language that or vocabulary that we're not comfortable with, we end up not saying anything at all. And I've come across that more times than I wish. And then when I have a, a conversation with a student, they have really good ideas. It's just those ideas didn't make it onto the page because they were trying to sound, uh, it, it's, it's gonna sound cliche, but they were trying to sound smart instead of actually communicating. I hope that makes sense. Beyond that, know who your audience is with these students. We can assume some commonalities of students at SDSU, but because your argument is so specific, you might be assuming that you're writing to a diverse audience. Um, you might be writing to an audience that shares your identity. You might be writing to an audience that believes that America diversity is a strength. You might be writing to an audience that is, is afraid of diversity. You might be writing to an audience that you know that they believe in climate change, or you might be writing to an audience that is skeptical about climate change, or you might be writing to an audience that has some experience with mental illness um, because of family or friends or themselves. Do you see what I mean? is like you are writing to a very specific audience. And so write for that audience. You won't be able to reach everybody because if you are writing to an audience that's afraid of diversity in the US, then, you're, then you are going to adapt your language to help them see that they don't need to be afraid of it. Does that make sense? Think about your audience. You're going to be asked to justify this in your analysis of your paper. And that's really important that you know who your audience is and that you start thinking about how am I gonna reach that audience? Questions about that?
Another question that I got um, concerned adopting a voice of authority. Most of you or many of you said, I don't know how to sound like I'm an authority when I'm not an authority. Well, first of all, who are you? What is your identity? Um, you have lived in the US, some of you for a short time, some of you for a long time. Um, you have experiences that make you an authority on some things. Embrace that, share that. Use first person and let your reader know who you are. In fact, Teresa Tony says adopting a voice of authority isn't pretending like you know everything, but it is using first person and third person. She recommends not using second person. If you do decide to use second person, use it intentionally and make sure it's strengthening your argument. Uh, e. Shelley Reed used second person and it did indeed strengthen her argument and her connection with the audience. However, not all the writers from writing spaces use second person. It depends. Be aware of what you're doing. That's what it means to write rhetorically, is to be aware that you have an argument, you have a purpose, and you get to adapt the way you connect with your audience and you can be specific, what's working best. The other way Teresa Tony says to adopt a voice of authority is to use concise language, eliminating unnecessary words. Now, if we are talking with someone one-on-one, -on -one, we might pause, we might fill in the gaps with um or like, or you know, or now, um, I remember President Obama, when he wanted to um, do this, he would say, now let me be perfectly clear. These are filler words. Teresa Tony is talking about the filler words that we use when we write. And she says, at the end, go back. Do you have filler words that aren't working um, that are just filling gaps, they aren't doing anything valuable, then take those out. That's the concise language that makes you adopt a voice of authority. And back to Aristotle, building your own ethos is adopting a voice of authority. He says we're more likely to trust a speaker or a writer when they seem knowledgeable, when they seem to share our values, when they seem to show concern, when they seem to be fair or objective, or they seem like good people. What is gonna make you seem like a good person with your specific audience? What values do you wanna emphasize with your examples? Keep in mind how Eric Liu established rapport when he asked about culture wars. And he assumed his audience thought that ethnic education was a good thing. When he assumed his audience would want to take down um, Confederate statues. When he assumed his audience was in favor of gay rights. He did all of that in the very first few sentences. How do you show that you share your audience's values? You also need to join the conversation. What have others said? Don't assume, you need to review what others say and you need to make it clear, not assuming that your audience just knows what conversation you're jumping into. Teresa Tony says this helps you seem knowledgeable when you can review the ideas in an argument. Think about how Eric Liu did that. Teresa Tony showed she was joining a conversation by reviewing lots and lots of scholars. 
you may not need to do it exactly like that. And in fact, a lot of you said that was really boring. So think about the conversations you need to review so you can show you're entering in to a conversation. It helps you seem knowledgeable. It helps your audience see how you're extending that conversation and it helps you show why that conversation matters. Your use of examples, your use of evidence, your use of arguments, your use of statistics all help you build exigency, that sense that this is an important conversation and it makes it seem like you are knowledgeable about the conversation you're joining. Any questions about that? Along those lines, I want to review something that you've probably seen before, and that is the concept of an introductory paragraphs being an upside down triangle. They start fairly broad by introducing a topic, and then they narrow as you, the author, review what other people have said and provide background information that ultimately leads to the place where you're joining the conversation. So it's very cohesive. So you've got the background information, the conversation, and the thesis statement. The thing you are adding is a project statement. And you saw how Eric Liu added a project statement. You saw how Teresa Tony added a project statement. It's very important that you have that. Questions? And now I'm back to um, E. Shelley Reed and writing rhetorically. Hopefully you chose a topic you care about. Um, you're gonna show and not just tell and you're adapting to your audience and your purpose. You're mindful of what you wanna accomplish with this, how you wanna change the way your readers think. And I know some of you are adding a call to action. E. Shelley Reed says, don't assume that your readers know what's going on in your head. Fill in the gaps for them. Don't assume they know everything you know. This might include the con ongoing conversation. It might be include defining terms that you want them to be aware of. It might include some history about the situation. Don't assume that they can connect your uh, evidence to your claims without your analysis. And don't assume your audience is gonna see why you're using quotations or statistics or examples unless you provide that analysis. You've gotta fill in the gaps for them so they don't have to guess what you're thinking. You might remember E. Shelley Reed and the little green ball. And she says, um, try something. Imagine I'm standing here with a little green ball in my hand. What do you see? And obviously we all saw something different. I saw a bouncy ball that you can find in a quarter machine. My bouncy ball is lime green with sparkles in it, little glitter. Um, but some of you saw a tennis ball. Some of you saw something else. So don't just tell, don't use imprecise language, use specific concrete language, examples with analysis, evidence with analysis, narratives with analysis, statistics with analysis. Be very specific. E. Shelley Reed talks about the pink house. You tell you were driving along a freeway and you tell the passenger in the car, we're going to drive by this amazing pink house, but you're doing 70 miles an hour on the freeway and you turn to your, as you pass it, you turn to the passenger and you say, wasn't that awesome? And they say, what? Because they didn't catch it because you, the driver, weren't guiding them. So how do you guide readers? You give them a clear project statement so they know where you're going. You give them a clear thesis so they know what to look for. You give them topic sentences that remind them about how you're connecting the dots. You're always keeping the thesis in mind for the audience, you're giving summary sentences. Here's what I just said. You're repeating keywords and phrases. You're using repetition to build bridges between ideas. This is your 
your job is to keep your reader on track so they know what they're looking for so they don't miss it when you drive by at 70 miles an hour or faster, depending on if you're fast driving. E. Shelley Reed talks about fruit jello and arguments. As you're explaining your ideas and you're making claims, always ask yourself, how do I know this? Have I given evidence of this? How does this evidence reveal that? So you've got evidence that shows how you know this and you're analyzing that evidence. Your readers can connect the dots. The whole idea of paragraphs and laundry. A lot of you asked about that. How many paragraphs do I need? And I probably wrote something like, you're creating a complex argument. This isn't just three main ideas and done. This is complexity where you're defining things and you're developing ideas. You might have one main idea that you've divided up into multiple points in order to develop it. Complexity means more paragraphs because you've got to guide your readers through your logic. So how long do paragraphs need? It depends on what your pair need to be. It depends on what your paragraph is doing. Are you analyzing cause and effect? Here's the cause, here's the effect. That takes some space. That might be two paragraphs. Are you classifying and dividing? Um, that means creating a list of things. Again, that could be a long paragraph. Are you comparing and contrasting two different things, three different things? If you're defining something in your paragraph, that might be a shorter paragraph. Are you describing something? Are you explaining a process? Are you narrating, telling a story? Are you providing examples? Again, that might be shorter paragraphs. So think about what your paragraph is doing. You just have a paragraph that has a piece of evidence in it. Ask yourself, what do I need to do with this evidence? In fact, ask yourself over and over again, what do I need this paragraph to do in order to develop my argument? Along those lines, think about how you can organize your essay because your essay should have some clear organization. You might be telling a story in chronological order you might be comparing and contrasting something throughout your essay. You might be showing cause and effect throughout the essay. Remember how Teresa Tony built her, the body of her essay. She divided everything up into six categories. She used classification and division as an organizing motif for her essay. You can do that too. Um, Lou divided his essay up into three main parts and he listed them. And then he followed that organization. You're gonna be using a project statement. So make sure that you know what you're gonna do how you're gonna organize it and show your readers how you're gonna organize it so they can follow. The final two slides have to do with E. Shelley Reed's suggestion at the end of 10 Ways to Think About Writing. And she says, as a writer in college and as a writer in the larger world, full of real readers. That's what I want you to imagine that you are doing right now. You need to free yourself from rules and learn to make rhetorical decisions. From now on, when you hear someone tell you a rule for writing, try to figure out the rhetorical challenge that lies behind it and consider the balancing acts you may need to undertake. What do you wanna say and what is gonna help the readers and your primary audience see what you mean and follow you? She says, there aren't any easy answers. Writing is still hard. But the good news is that you can use a few helpful rules as a starting point when they seem appropriate and set aside the rest. 
You can draw on some key principles or metaphors to help you imagine the needs of your readers. And when you come to an open space, when there doesn't seem to be a perfect rule or strategy to use, you can try something. In the end, that's what writers are always doing as we write. We're trying this, we're trying that, we're trying something else, hoping that we'll make a breakthrough so that our readers will say, aha, I see what you mean, and they really truly see it. Every one of you is writing about something that's super, super important. So take a deep breath, push all those naysaying rule makers into the far corners of your brain, focus on your current audience and purpose and write. Raise your voice, say something that matters and say it to your audience so they know what you want them to know so that they feel what you want them to feel so that they do what you want them to do. That is all I've got. Any quick questions for me before I send you into your groups? All right then. Um, 